All right, everybody, it's seven o'clock and uh, very glad to have you all with us. This is the latest installment of Cam and Chris's webinar series. Uh, tonight we have Mike Gennaro with us from Yale University and he's going to talk about uh, 10 things that he, he, looking back, wishes he knew in high school. And, um, and, you know, just get things rolling like we normally do. There we go. Uh, upcoming webinars. Tomorrow night we have Chris Kerber from Cornell talking about leadership and uh, leading through tough times, adversity, uh, like we're living in now. Saturday we have two. We have back to back. For those of you who don't have home training, you know, home gyms, you know, what do you have? What can you set up to still get your strength training in around the house? Uh, and that will be followed up with uh, strength training to build the back and spare the spine. So that's going to be focusing in on how to do lifts correctly, especially ones that revolve around the back and the hip hinge. Um, so those will be Saturday. Jim Dietz will be doing one for the Masters, rigging for the Masters on Monday. And Coach Steve Gladstone from Yale as well will be working on uh, selection, how he selects his team and, and how he selects his lineups. And so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, interesting things to come out of that one as well. Um, today, uh, I'm not surprised by this. Normally, uh, California has been killing it, uh, winning every night. But today, Philadelphia, or, uh, Pennsylvania, right? Go Birds. Mike Gennaro is on. So home team is filling up right now. One thing about that slide, Chris, is that there's a very significant spike in Oregon. And I'm wondering, Mike Gennaro, is your fan club based in Oregon? Is that a, a, an unknown fact about you? Uh, there, it, you know, the fans are all over the world, Cam. All right. Of course. <laughs> well, I saw a lot of Rose City kids, so uh, good to have you, Rose City guys and gals. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, unshare Mike, and I'm going to send it to you and get you guys started. All right. Mike, before before we do that, uh, everybody out there listening, if you have questions at the bottom or wherever your bar is on your on your screen, there's a Q and A. If you have questions and you want to throw it in there. Uh, Cam and I will will uh, check out the questions and without interrupting Mike's flow, we'll try to insert those questions. We may not get to all of them, so uh, but we'll do the best we can to get to to ones that uh, matter to the most amount of people. And then at the end, Mike said he's going to leave some time uh, for questions and answers as well. So, all right, Mike. Are you, can you uh, can you see the screen, Chris? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, and thanks Chris and Cam for having me. I think these webinars, uh, it's a great idea. Um, I was talking to Chris before we started, uh, all the seasons getting canceled. It was a pretty, pretty tough pill to swallow. It happened so abruptly uh, at the most important part of the year. So uh, I think we're all kind of yearning to have anything to do with rowing, uh, talk about it, listen, watch uh so th these have been great uh so thanks for having me uh and let's get started um so the topic's going to be things that i learned over the course of my rowing career uh that i wish i would have known in high school uh and i narrowed it down to seven um but you know it's a pretty it's a pretty long list um so we'll start here uh I'm Mike Gennaro. Uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. Uh, I have six brothers and sisters. Uh, that's my parents right there and uh, my older brother and my older sister. Uh, and then a couple more were, were born after that. Uh, but I grew up in a pretty, pretty athletic neighborhood. Um, a lot of parks, all the kids in the neighborhood played sports. I grew up loving playing anything, uh, just running around the neighborhood, basketball, football, baseball. Um, and similar to probably a lot of people in the rowing world, uh, I got into rowing because uh, I stunk at every other sport. Uh, by the time you get to high school, by the time I got to high school, um, football and basketball were kind of monsters of their own. And uh, I wasn't as big or strong as other people. Um, and fortunately, I went to St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia, uh, which offered rowing. Um, and the comforting thing about starting rowing at the time was that everybody was starting fresh. Uh, so it wasn't 
it, it wasn't very intimidating because nobody knew what they were doing. Uh, so, you know, we all virtually started on the same level. Um, road at St. Joe's Prep. Uh, then I went on the row at Syracuse for Dave Reichman. Um, rode on three under 23 national teams while I was at Syracuse. Uh, then went on the row for the senior national team after college. Uh, I got cut from the 2016 Olympic team. And that lined up pretty well with the job opening uh, here at Yale. And I've been here since the fall of 2016. Um, and that's, that's my rowing career. Um, I'm proud of it. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that my parents twisted my arm to row. Uh, I think that my rowing career is my greatest achievement in life. Uh, next to convincing my wife to marry me. Um, so all of that, all of my rowing uh, and now my short coaching career, um, I guess, well, what happened in my rowing career is, is kind of right now it's, it's shaping me to be a certain type of coach and part of the collegiate coaching world is recruiting and I interact with a lot of high school athletes and that, that makes me reflect back on my high school rowing career a lot. And I find myself giving high school oarsmen uh, advice that, uh, that I guess would make me hypocritical because it's a lot of stuff that I didn't do when I was their age, but uh, I wish I would have known. Um, excuse me, I'm going to keep reading through some of these notes. So um, First thing that comes to mind uh, is that the ball is, is, is in your court. And this is me speaking directly to high school oarsmen and oarswomen. Um, I think a lot of athletes, especially in the recruiting world, but just in general, they, they uh, at that age, and I, I know from my experience, I spent a lot of time kind of waiting for something to happen or waiting for a coach to select me or just hoping that erg scores would get faster just because they were going to get faster. Just because I was 15, 16, 17 years old, my body's naturally growing. I'm getting bigger. I'm getting stronger just by chance. And that makes you faster on the erg. But, uh, you know, I, I would love to be able to go back and tell my high school self that you're, you're in charge of your progress. Um, one of the main reasons that I fell in love with rowing is because of how simple of a sport it is. Obviously, uh, it can get complicated. Uh, you know, it, it's not an easy sport. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. But we don't rely on a coach calling a play where you get the ball. Um, and that, I mean, I, I think that's great because all, you know, you, 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 we repeat the same motion over and over again. And with fitness, with fitness, fitness and rowing is binary. So the work that you put in, you're going to get that much faster and that much stronger. Uh, and it's important to remember that it's important to remember that you have to do the work in order to get faster. You're in charge of your success. And there's a lot of high school athletes that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they understand that, or maybe they understand it and they don't want to believe it because unfortunately in this sport, uh, doing the work is hard and sometimes it's boring. Sitting on the erg for an extended period of time is not all that much fun to do, but that's how you get faster. And you need to understand that in order to get better. You need to be accountable for that. Um, Mike Tatey, uh, who is the men's Olympic coach, uh, he said, or he always says that if you want to get better at shooting foul shots, you have to shoot foul shots. And that, that always resonated with me because when I was younger, unfortunately, I would try to talk myself out of doing certain workouts, or I would try to convince myself that I could do something other than set the erg up for 60 minutes and row some steady state. I would try to convince myself that I'm going to go for a run or I'm going to get on the bike or, you know, maybe if I play a couple games of basketball, that'll be good. If you want to get better at shooting foul shots, you shoot foul shots. If you want to get better at rowing, you have to row. If you want your erg score to be faster, then you have to row on the erg. There's no substitute. And that's, 
That's the gospel. That's, that's the truth. That's what you have to do to get faster. And you're in charge of that. You don't need, you don't need a whole team of people to do that. It's nice when you have a team around you to do that, but uh, you know, it's not like being a quarterback in football and you need, you need someone to catch the passes. Uh, you, know, you, you don't need to rely on anybody else. You're in charge of your success. Uh, and I, I, think, I think that's important. I think that's important, especially in our world where everybody's concerned about uh, 2K scores and such. Number two, be professional. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that took me a while to learn in my career. It's something that I knew had to happen. Um, and I think in some areas of my rowing career, I did it. And in other areas, I didn't do it. Uh, coach Gladstone, uh, the head coach at Yale here, he preaches a lot about what he calls being pro row. He talks to our guys about being professional and acting like professionals uh, in all aspects of their life. And then that's going to make you, it's going to make you a better rower. If you, if you do all the little things correctly, then the bigger things are going to be easier to accomplish. Um, in, in high school, uh, some of the, some examples of how I struggled to be professional uh, in high school, I think I was a little hesitant to put two feet in. Um, like I said earlier, rowing was new to everybody. Uh, you know, we grew up playing other sports and watching other sports and following professional athletes and other sports. And now all of a sudden we're going to start this rowing thing that we really don't know anything about. And it, was, it took me a while to figure out that the only way you were going to get better, the quickest way to get better, was to fully invest yourself in that process and dive right in. And I think I was worrying a little bit too much about how it looked or what was cool or what wasn't cool or, you know, how hard to try and how that was going to be perceived by others. Um, and then when you get to college, it's difficult to be professional all the time because there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of social distractions. Uh, there's a lot of social temptations and there's a whole world going on around you in college um, that, isn't trying to be professional at a sport. So it's, it's hard to convince yourself to be professional around the clock in college. And then on the national team, um, you know, I guess in, in one sense, it's easier to be professional because you know that you've reached this level, um, you know, being on the senior national team. But it's also hard to be professional when you, when you row full-time as a full-time job because – uh, you know, you always feel like you need a break and you always kind of want to just turn it off and get away. And uh, you just, you, you can't do that. You, got, you have to be trying to get better all the time. Uh, so I talk about doing, doing the little things correctly. And that is, that's important. Uh, this sport is very mental. Uh, we all know that. That's not, it's not any groundbreaking information, but um, in order to be successful and in order to be successful in this sport, you have to have a clear mind. Your brain needs to be organized. It needs to be clear and you need to take care of all the little things in your life so that when you show up to practice, you can get better at rowing. And thinking back to those three phases, uh, whether it was high school or college or the national team, uh, you know, different practices from different times stand out uh, on my mind when I think about it. And anytime I had a bad practice or anytime I was struggling with something, it, it usually wasn't the thing that I was trying to work on that was causing the problem. Um, it, was, it was stress from some other part of my life. And that interfered with me becoming a better rower because I couldn't focus on repeating the same motion or I couldn't focus on pushing myself or what have you, because I was, my brain was somewhere else while I was sitting in a boat at practice. Um, building good habits. This is where um, my 17, 18 year old self would, would be laughing at my 31 year old self, hearing me talk about nutrition and stretching and hydration. Uh, this was easily the Achilles heel of my rowing career. And, you know, it's just for the high school rowers out there, you have to, you have to build these habits now. You have to. 
uh, because it just gets harder and harder to build those habits later when you've already started developing bad habits. Uh, my nutrition career is atrocious. It's not something I really want to talk about. It's not something I'm proud of, but uh, it just, it took me a really long time to understand, um, you know, that you got to put the right fuel in your body. Um, recovering, eating the right things after practice. Uh, it just, it took me way, way, way too long to figure out that that makes a difference. And I just kept telling myself, it doesn't make a difference. It is what it is. Whether I eat this now or eat it an hour from now or eat whatever, it's not going to make a difference. And it wasn't until a little bit in college, but definitely on the national team when, you, when I was surrounded by people that were fully committed to understanding nutrition, uh, practicing sound nutrition, hydration, stretching. It wasn't until I was surrounded by those people that I realized that it, it makes a lot of difference. And uh, it was very unprofessional to talk myself out of that. Stretching is a big one. Uh, stretching is not something that <laughs> I enjoyed doing. Um, you know, after practice, for as long as I can remember in my rowing career, I just wanted to shower and get home. I just wanted to get in and get out of there. Uh, I don't really know why. I mean, there's an, a couple different reasons why, but um, that's another thing that you just, you have to build good habits. You have to, you have to just, you have to do it and you have to do it every day. And uh, stretching is something that can be better done with a group of people, getting teammates to do it, just getting the whole the whole boathouse to do it, then it becomes easier. You don't feel like you're dragging yourself to do it by yourself. But uh, I had some, I had some tough injuries in my career. I blew my back out three or four different times, and it was nobody's fault but my own. Um, you know, you kind of I would sit in a boat for an hour and a half, once a day, twice a day, and your body's making this this motion, and your hips are doing this, and your back's doing that. And everybody would tell me how important it was to stretch and loosen them up. And I wouldn't do it. And I was just, every time I didn't get into a stretching routine, my body and my lower back was just a ticking bomb. Um, and a big, a big part of getting better in this sport is, is being professional and understanding that these things make a difference. It doesn't matter if you've never been injured before. Um, it's, it's professional. That's, that's what you have to do. Um, go to the next one. Oh, there's some good pictures. Yeah, a couple of my, uh, couple of my bad e eating habits there. Okay, educate yourself. Uh, this goes hand in hand with being professional. Um, my rowing career progressed in, in phases from high school to college to the national career in terms of what I'll refer to as my, my rowing IQ. And uh, part of that is because I think part of that is a natural progression. Uh, I think there are certain things high school oarsmen need to be worried about. And it's not quite the same as things that national team rowers should be worrying about. If you can understand that, you know, when, when you start off the sport, your first couple of years, you know, you don't really need to be worrying about some of the more complex stuff that we would learn about later on. But I think I, I, I don't think I know that, I, stunt, I stunted my own education of the sport because I didn't really put a lot of effort into it. Um, uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask questions as often as I should. Uh, I think everybody in here is guilty of sitting in a boat, a coach telling you to do something, asking you if you understand that, and you just kind of nod your head, yeah, because you kind of want the coach to stop talking to you and worry about something else. And uh, that's not a good way to be. And it took me a long time to figure that out. Uh, it took me a, a while to figure out how important it is to be a student of the sport. Uh, Coach Gladstone has this phrase that uh, sometimes he'll use when he thinks that a rower is doing that, where he's coaching them, uh, and he thinks that the rower is just nodding yes, but not really understanding. Steve will always say, let's not, let's not have you pretend to listen, and I'll pretend to coach. Let's, let's actually do it. And that is, that's important. There, I, I could, there's a million different reasons why you need to understand what a coach is saying and not only understand what he's saying, but understand why and also understand why not. And when you start getting that thought process 
of understanding what am I doing? Why does the coach think it's wrong? Why is it wrong? Why, why can't I do that? Is it, what is it, how is it hurting the boat? Um, why does he want me to make this change? What impact is that going to have on the boat? How do I make the change? All of these thoughts are going to expand your rowing IQ. And I've learned that it makes it easier. It makes it easier to make certain changes when you understand why you shouldn't be doing something. Um, I guess an example of that is uh, back, back to my horrible stretching routine. Um, I, my hamstrings are like concrete blocks and I always struggle to, to hold my knees flat and pivot my body forward. And I just, for the longest time, I never really understood what, like, what's the big deal. Uh, by the time I get up to the catch, I'm at full extension. You know, it, like, what, why at this moment do I have to put my body in pain and hold my knees flat just to get my body over? And it wasn't until I started asking questions or maybe there was a coach that explained it differently, but you need to understand that if you don't get everything prepared on backstops, then while you're moving into the stern, you're trying to get your body angle forward and you're going to check the boat down. Now, when you understand that, uh, it's pretty hard to argue against holding your knees flat and pivoting your body forward. But sitting in a boat and a coach just saying to get your body forward, yeah, you can, okay, I got it, I'll do it, no big deal. But uh, it's only a matter of time before you go back to not doing that because you don't fully understand why you should do that or shouldn't be doing that. And that's important. And I urge any rower in here to ask questions when you don't understand something. And you need to also understand that there's a, an appropriate time and a place for that. And there's an appropriate, uh, you know, kind of attitude that goes along with asking those questions. But uh, you're just, you're wasting time if you're sitting in a boat being told to do something and you don't understand why or why not. Um, uh, I guess along with that is, also comes with understanding perspective. And I don't remember who told me this. I, I, think, I think it was Dave Reichman, but uh, Dave Reichman is the head, head coach at Syracuse. But just because a change feels different doesn't mean it's wrong. And when I first heard that, it's just this whole world of, of rowing just came, it just came to life. It, it, because coaches tell you to do something and you go to make the change and your brain right away says, that's not, that's not right. That doesn't feel normal. But what you need to understand is your normal was wrong. And uh, in this picture here, that's me and uh, Henrik Rummel in, in the bow there, that pair. And I learned that lesson from Henrik. Uh, I sat behind him in a straight four for a couple years. And Henrik would drive his legs down very quickly. And I would drive my legs down rather slowly. And Every time uh, Coach Volp would tell me to push my legs down with Henrik, I, I felt ridiculous. I always thought I was doing it wrong. I would tell my, there's no way that this is right. There's no way that, like, I, I, there's no way. And so one practice, you know, Volp's kind of getting on me about making the change. And I know that I'm capable of making the change. And I just kind of, I just let it go. I just, I just, you know, I just did it. I just started jamming my legs down because I'm like, that's what he's telling me to do. And after practice, he showed me a video and it was, it was spot on. And then I started thinking, well, it just felt so weird. There's no way that that could have been right. But what I didn't understand was what felt normal to me was a very, very slow leg drive. So anything quicker than that is going to feel like I'm shooting my seat or anything quicker than that is going to feel like I'm jamming my legs down. But that's just because my brain is used to a slower leg drive. So understanding perspective, understanding that when you make a change, it's certainly going to feel different, uh, is going to help you make better changes and uh, most importantly, hold on to those changes. Um, hey, Mike. Yeah. In terms of uh, helping the athlete understand and going back to the nutrition, do, do the Yale rowers get a lot of feedback from the coaching staff about nutrition? Do you you spend a lot of time talking with them and hoping, you know, that they find a better understanding of how nutrition is going to help them or hurt them, depending on what it is that they eat. How much interaction is there on that? 
Yeah, I guess it, it, it varies on the rower. Uh, like I said, that my nutrition problem, uh, I hope is, uh, is kind of closer to the, to the percentile. Uh, you know, I hope there's not a lot of people that do what I do. I think there are a lot of rowers out there who understand nutrition, um, and have a good understanding of it. Um, in my coaching career, because I wasn't, uh, anything near a nutritionist, I, I try to help these guys, but I also try to defer that job to somebody who knows a lot more than I do. But uh, we certainly are aware of what the guys eat. We, we, we try to let them know, uh, you know, the windows for recovery, how to recover. Um, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to talk about what you shouldn't be eating and what you shouldn't be drinking. But um, yeah, so I wouldn't say we have a full on, you know, we don't have a full time nutritionist on our staff. But uh, we do our best to help these guys understand that that's, that that makes a difference. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, that's not a picture of me educating myself, by the way. It's a picture of me texting, but I thought it could have been relevant. All right, number four, don't limit yourself. Um, this is important. This is important going back to uh, the high school oarsmen and in particular the 2000 meter erg test that we all have that love hate relationship with. And I, in my rowing career, my worst enemy was my brain. And there were a lot of moments, whether it was high school or college or the national team, where my brain got in the way of me getting better. Um, and I didn't, I didn't trust what was going on. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to control my thoughts and ignore, you know, the, the negative stuff. And, uh, that happened a lot with two case as I, I, I would imagine people in here, uh, can relate to what I learned on the national team, which I really wish I would have known in high school was that two K's are fitness indicators. 2Ks and 6Ks and 5Ks, any kind of ERG test, it's a fitness indicator. It's a, it's a potential indicator. And when I realized that, I stopped fearing certain milestones. Uh, I wasn't afraid to try to break this time or break that time because I, I've never done it before. And only, only these kinds of people do that. And oh, there's no way that I can do that. But an ERG test is a fitness indicator. And if you train hard, if you put in the work, if you put in the effort and you get fit and you get stronger, then you owe it to yourself to be redefined by a better ERG score. And there have been, I wasted way too much time in my rowing career being a 605 guy or a 558 guy when I know that I could have gone faster, but I didn't. And it just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you can't, you can't go through your rowing career, you know, being the person with the slower urge score because you can't perform on test day. And the best way to be able to perform on test day is being, you know, organizing your thoughts, being professional about your preparation and trusting your fitness and remembering all the work you put in, all the steady state you put in, all the pieces that you've done, and then coming out with a smart, intelligent race plan for the ERG test, and then doing what you're capable of doing. And like I said, I, I talked myself out of that a lot. And it's a regret because I think back to all the miles and all the kilometers I put in on the ERG to get stronger. And I know I got stronger. And I wasn't able to show that on race day because uh, I limited myself. Um, another area of this topic is don't try to, don't try to, don't waste any time trying to figure out what the coaches are doing. And this is something that I learned before I became a coach. Uh, it's something that you have to learn on, on the national team because uh, you'll, you'll lose a lot of sleep over trying to figure out what the coach is doing. And now I, I really understand it as a coach, but I wish I could go back and tell my high school self that because 
it's just, it just gets in the way. Uh, showing up to practice, hearing the lineups, reading the lineups, and right away you're just like, why am I in this seat? Why am I in that seat? What, what does it mean? I, I was over there yesterday, and now I'm over there. How come I'm not in this seat? How come I'm not in that seat? And all that does is get in the way of your training and your progress. And you need to trust what's going on. You need to row the boat. You need to follow the instructions. Let the coaches coach. Let the rowers row. And don't waste any time trying to figure out what everything means. Um, yeah, that's easier said than done, uh, but it's, it's important. And it's the, the last thing, the last thing on this topic that jumps to mind, uh, in particular with, with the high school rowers again, and I see this more as a, as a college coach talking to athletes and recruiting, but you can't let your surroundings and, the, and your circumstances limit you and what you're capable of. And what I mean by that is you can't look around the room and let that determine how good you can be. And there's, there's a lot of athletes out there that maybe, maybe you row at a small program. Uh, maybe you row at a program that hasn't had a lot of success. Maybe it's a new program. And sometimes, sometimes uh, people's goals are, are way, sh way shorter than what they're capable of because they're just basing it off of this small program. And, you know, our, our, our club's 2K record is a 618, and I'm going to break that this year. I'm going to I'm going to break all these records from my school. But what is I don't even know what that means. Uh, it, it could mean anything. It could maybe your school wasn't all that fast. Maybe there weren't rowers that came before you that had your potential or had your work ethic. And you need to not let that limit yourself. You need to train. You need to move forward. You need to progress steadily, and don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. And uh, that's, that's important. Um, I learned that lesson at Syracuse um, a lot because I think I, I think I looked around the room a lot and kind of decided what I was going to do at the time based on what everybody else was going to do. And I just did my best to make sure that uh, nobody was ahead of me. But that wasn't advantageous to me doing my best or getting as fast as I could. So don't limit yourself. Number four. Number five. This is, uh, this is most important. This is, if you're not going to listen to anything that I've said, uh, I would encourage you to listen to this because it's, I, I think it'll, it'll uh, be relevant to a lot of people. Uh, adding value and bringing something to the table. This is, I like to think that this is, this was the bread and butter of my rowing career. Uh, I, I was never the biggest guy. I was never the strongest guy. I was never the fastest guy. I was never the best rower. But I always felt like I had the ability to add value to a crew because of whatever the reason is. And that's very important. I think we can all we can all understand that <laughs> there are certain boats that go fast and you can't explain it. And sometimes the best way to explain it is that they just click. And there's nothing worse than having a certain type of personality in your boat or somebody that's frustrating to work with or somebody that doesn't want to do this or doesn't want to do that. And you can make a boat go faster just by being a good teammate, just by being a good person, by having fun, by creating an environment, by creating a culture, by getting people excited. You don't, you don't need to be the biggest or the strongest or the fastest rower to be in the best boat. And I found myself in that position a lot over the course of my career. And when I finally understood that, um, it, uh, it you know it made me it made me better and early in my career I didn't understand that and when I wasn't the best guy or when there were people that were stronger than me it would kind of make me do this or when there were people that were bigger or older than me it kind of made me do that and uh, and that that stopped me from contributing that stopped me from doing the best that I could and uh, 
you know, this is not, this is not necessarily a rowing piece of advice. It's also, I guess, life advice, but it's a good way to live your life. You want to, it's similar to seat racing where you're in a boat and when you're not in that boat, you want those people to know that you're not in that boat. You want to have an impact in some way so that when you're not there, people notice that. And that can go, you know, that, that can go with athletics, that can go with friends, that can go with school projects. You want, to, you want to be present. You want to be doing something. We're putting in all this work and all this effort, sitting on the erg for so long. You want to get something out of it. Don't, don't be a passenger. Don't be quiet. Don't be shy. There's obviously a time and a place for questions and talking and energy and excitement and hooting and hollering, but you want to make sure that you're bringing something to the table and you want to make sure that when you're not there, it's noticeable. And if that happens, then, then you know that you're adding value to the situation that you're in. Um, that's important. Like I said, that's, uh, that's kind of, that's, how I had some success in my career was because um, I felt like I brought something to the table that other people couldn't, or maybe I understood what a boat needed. I, I, I certainly wasn't going to be the horsepower guy. I certainly wasn't going to be the, the big tall guy that sat in the middle, but I wasn't okay with just being a bow four guy that's going to set the boat for everybody else. I wanted to try to find a way to help the crew out. And when I did that, and then I wasn't in the crew, hopefully it made a difference or, or hopefully it, it showed what I, what I was worth or what I was capable of. Um, and if I, I wish I would have learned that earlier in my career instead of, uh, you know, worrying about who I was or what I was or what other people thought of me kind of thing. Uh, this is important piece number two behind add value. This is, uh, this is very important to me. Um, we, <laughs> rowing is not a spectator sport. And it took me way too long in my rowing career to realize the sacrifices that people made for me in my life. And I was so focused in high school on winning and beating people or trying to do this or trying to do that or getting all hyped up about my rowing. And I don't know if I ever thanked all the people that helped me do what I was doing. Um, and I also think in high school, we're all, we're all new to the sport. So I, I, one of the reasons why I fell in love with rowing was because Growing up, I was very, uh, I guess, jealous would be the word of other athletes in other sports. I was never the starting quarterback. I was never the guy that scored the most points. I was never the star of a team. And when I, when I started rowing, I loved that that wasn't there. There wasn't any particular guy that was more important than another just because of the position he played or just because of the coach wanted that guy to have the ball or not that guy to have the ball. And I love that about rowing. But in high school, when I started having some success, I think I started turning in a bit to that person. And I was real proud of my success. And everyone, everyone knew that I was doing it. And I made the junior national team. And that was a big deal. And I got all the junior national gear. And I was really proud of myself. I thought I was the man. and completely overlooked all the people that helped me get there. And then when I got to college, I started to understand a little bit that there were people on my team that were making me better. Uh, there were guys that were pushing me and guys that weren't letting me tread water and that made me better. And so I started to appreciate those guys. I started to really uh, understand that I needed those guys to get to where I wanted to get. Uh, and then when I got to the senior national team, it just became really apparent that uh, I, I didn't achieve any of this really by myself. Uh, and it starts with my parents, that's, that's my mom there and that's my dad. Um, you know, it starts with the sacrifices that they made, um, all the coaches that I've had in my life, uh, in particular in high school where 
it, it wasn't their full-time job. Uh, and there were a lot of coaches that I had that were volunteers and that were just doing it in their spare time because they loved it. Um, you know, and when you start to understand that and you start to thank those people, it, it puts, it puts this sport into perspective. It, it puts life into perspective and it, it helps alleviate some of the, some of the pressure and the stress of the sport. When you can understand these things and you can understand the people that are helping you try to be good at what you want to be good at, uh, it, you know, it just, it kind of gives you a little bit of extra muscle when you need it because you know that you're not alone. And it kind of took me of thinking I was doing it alone, being all pumped that I thought I was doing it alone, realizing that I was alone, I needed some help crashing and burning, and then realizing that I had a whole world of people that were going to help me get to where I wanted to go. When I realized that, uh, things, things got a lot better and got a lot easier. Um, in my rowing career, I was fortunate enough to win some medals at the world championships. And, uh, and I don't, I don't have any of them anymore. Uh, I gifted all of them away. Um, every single medal I've ever won, I've given to friends or family or coaches because it was the absolute least I could do to thank these people for helping me get to where I wanted to get. And, uh, when I started doing that, uh, yeah, it just, that kind of changed my life. It kind of, it really put all this into perspective and, like I said, when I was younger in high school, winning the Stotesbury Cup Regatta was all I thought about. It's all I cared about, and I would have done anything to have achieved that, but it also blinded me towards what else was going on around me and all the people that were trying to help me. So I don't think you know, we don't need to dwell on that. I think that that's another piece of life advice, but uh, I like to think that it can help with your rowing because it is it is, it is a unique sport. Uh, and just consider, to all the high school kids out there, just consider what your parents are doing for you. Uh, a lot of you might not have driver's license. Uh, a lot of your parents might get up really early in the morning um, to drive you somewhere or to go down and stand on a riverbank for nine hours just to see you go by for 200 meters. Uh, and just make sure that you appreciate that and thank them. Uh, and the last point, Pretty, pretty simple. It's just, just enjoy it. Uh, that goes for coaches. That goes for rowers. Um, you know, the, the further away that I get from my rowing career, um, the more I realize how special it was, how much fun it was. And I, I would do anything to go back and get in the boat with some of these guys that I rowed with. Um, and I try to tell the guys that yell that it's, it's, it's obviously hard to, you know, get them to understand that, but uh, you know, anybody who doesn't row anymore will agree with me, but, uh, you know, thinking about how right now, how I really want to get back in a boat with some of my old teammates makes me think about all the practices where I took that for granted. Uh, and, or maybe it makes me think of the practices where I showed up to the boathouse kind of tired or I wasn't ready or I didn't feel like doing it and kind of dragged, dragged my feet into the, into the boathouse, into the locker room, uh, and I, I regret it because, like I said, right now, I would, I'd love to go back and get in a boat with some of my college buddies or some of my high school teammates or, you know, some of the guys from the national team. And uh, I can't. So for all of you out there that are doing it, uh, don't, don't waste it and, and certainly, certainly enjoy it. Uh, so that's that, Chris. Um, how bad was that? Just 45 minutes. Uh, it's just great listening. I think you're, it's been a great talk so far. You're really genuine and relatable, and, and I know that uh, everybody's appreciating it. There's a, there's a couple of questions here, if you don't mind jumping on some of them. Yeah. Is it? Uh, okay. Uh, can you, you wanna... see them, or do you want me to read them? Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead? I, it'll take me a while to read them and try to digest it, but what, what, are, what are you uh, saying? Question number one. Um, going back to eating and nutrition, how did you manage and balance – allowing yourself to eat junk food, to eat junk, and not feeling guilty or, or worried that it would affect you? Well, I didn't feel guilty at all about it. Was that, that was the whole point. <laughs> uh, no, I, it's, you, ha, you have to, that, the nutrition, you, ha, you have to educate yourself. Uh, you have to educate yourself on, on what you need, what is good, what is not good, 
And once you have a, an understanding of that, then and only then are you able to start making some exceptions for what, what people could refer to as a, as a cheat day. Uh, but you need to have a full understanding of what you need to eat before practice, what you need to eat after practice for recovery, uh, you know, kind of a balanced diet over the course of a seven day week. Uh, and that's gonna go hand in hand with what type of training you're doing. And then your diet will change. And once you build that habit, once you have that knowledge and you understand it, then you're not gonna feel so guilty about sliding in certain snacks or certain types of meals because you have a purpose with your nutrition, you know that it's helping your rowing, and then you'll know when you can and can't uh, have a cheat day, I guess. Uh, next question. What would you change during your recruiting process into college and what advice would you give to an aspiring collegiate rower? Yeah, uh, I am going to respectfully decline to answer that. I don't want to be, uh, I feel like that might conflict a little bit too much with my position at Yale. Um, I'm happy to talk to a certain recruit about that. If any, you know, it, I'm happy to talk about that as Mike Gennaro, the Yale coach, but I would, I would rather not focus on recruiting right now, if that's all right with you, Chris. And whoever asked that, I, I apologize. I just... None I needed. None needed. Fair enough. Down a, a recruiting um, role. Uh, I think you... I don't know. Uh, here, here's the next question. When was your first time going sub seven? Were you like five or six years old? How, when <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, probably my freshman year of high school. I, we didn't really do... We didn't do uh, many 2,000-meter erg pieces at at St. Joe's prep. So, uh, I don't know, but my erg was never, uh, I was never breaking any land speed records. I think, uh, you know, through high school, my best was probably 614 or 613. And, uh, I went six, six minutes point something my junior year of college. I didn't break six until my senior year of college. And, but I'll just echo what I said earlier. If you want your ERG score to be faster, you have to put in time on the ERG. There's no way around it. And if you can't understand that, you're, you're, just, you're not going to get faster. There's, there's no other way to get faster on the ERG than putting in time on the ERG. Next question. Megan Musniski uh, wrote on her Facebook page recently uh, this quote, we are, all made, we are made of all those who have built and broken us. What were the defining moments of failure or those who have broken you? Oh, man. Yeah, well, there's a lot more. Uh, hey, there's, a, there's a lot more broken moments than, than building moments. Uh, and that's, that is, that's important. That's important. I think, uh, I, you know, really any, any race I ever lost was a broken moment. And I learned a lot more from the losses than I did the wins. I think when we go down the race course and our bow ball is out in front and we win, we like to think that we did exactly what we planned on doing. We, we dreamed about doing that. We expected to do that. And then you did it. And I didn't reflect much on my wins because like I said, I, I did what I thought we were going to do, but I reflected it heck of a lot on the losses because you're sulking, you're angry, you're replaying it, you're trying to figure out what went wrong or what you could have done better. And uh, that, that, that's a good quote. Um, you know, getting, getting cut from the junior national team, my junior year of college, or, sorry, junior year of high school was, uh, was a pretty tough moment, like I said, because I thought I was doing really well and I thought I was getting somewhere and nothing like, uh, nothing like getting cut from a, training camp to to humble you uh you know losing some races in college getting cut from the olympic team all those moments made me a better human being not only just a better rower but like i said we we reflect on the losses a lot more than we do uh the wins and i guess also now that i think about it something that i learned over the course of my career that i think is pretty important is not to get too high from the highs and too low from the lows. And there's just, there's, there's a lot of examples from my career of when I won a race or I won a seat race 
uh, where I was doing well and I felt like I was on top of the world. And then you start acting differently and you don't train as, as hard as you did before because things are going well and you think you have it figured out. And then on the other end, you lose a race or you lose a seat race or things aren't going well. And then, you know, everything is chaos and you're scrambling to do this and you're trying to change that and you start, start changing everything about your life. And, uh, that was very important on the national team because over the course of a year with all the amount of practices we would have, uh, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and trying to stay even keeled, trying to kind of remember what's, what's centered, what's, what's the norm, and then kind of basing it off of that, uh, basing any adjustments off of that is important to do. You feel like now that you're a coach and, you know, you're not just a coach at any place, right? Your, your team's pretty good. Do you, do you find that you're, you're still having the same process of growth, the same things can break you down, the, the same, you know, losses, for instance, can still make you go back to the drawing board and, and find more growth? Not just as an athlete, but as a coach now. Yeah, I, I, it's – coaching has been fantastic. Uh, after getting cut from the Rio Olympic team, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And I'm very fortunate that Coach Gladstone offered me this job because it's really filled that part of my soul of, uh, you know, just kind of always working towards something, being emotional about something. It's – like I said, I got uh, – I got somewhere in my rowing career by – being emotional and passionate and adding value. And as my rowing career was kind of coming to an end, I was wondering where am I going to be able to keep doing this? Uh, and coaching has helped me do that. Uh, but it's tough. It's tough because you, you know, all, all the things you want to do as a coach to try to win aren't going to happen on race day uh, on race day. There's not a whole lot you can do uh, as Steve Gladstone says, the hay is in the barn. Uh, and it's difficult as a coach to launch a boat for a race. And then uh, you just have to stand there and wait and see what happens. Uh, you know, so you get the same type of nerves as I got as an athlete, but it's very difficult to get rid of the butterflies where at least as a rower, you'd be pretty nervous, but uh, you knew that you were going to have a chance to do something about it. The um, couple of things, uh, there's several of you guys who are, who are putting in questions about nutrition. Uh, just so you know, we're going to have a webinar coming up about nutrition, so we can really take a yeah, deep dive. Chris, let's 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 filter those out. Yeah. So we'll do a <laughs> we'll Appreciate do a deep that. dive um, on nutrition in a in a in a whole webinar just for that. Uh, here's one for you. There's a couple about this, Mike, and that is when you, how do you push yourself through the pain? How do you stay focused? What do you say to yourself? What is it you you, you do to, to talk yourself through those moments? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I, I might have mentioned it earlier, but kind of remembering and appreciating and trusting the work that you've done can help you through those moments of wanting to change course in the middle of a 2K or maybe back off a couple splits or maybe not jump to the next split. And the, you know, if, if you've done the work, if you've prepared if you've done the steady state you've done the practice pieces you've put in the time if you fully invested yourself in the preparation that should give you confidence when things get hard and that's like I said it took, took me a while to realize that but when I did it, it, it helped and another thing is uh Brian Volpenheim used to talk about uh acknowledging or accepting that this was going to hurt. And I, I, I know that I went into some 2K ergs, you know, trying to see how long I could go before it really started to get painful or, you know, try to do this or that to like not really feel like you're drowning. But before we did a 2K one time, Volp said that to the group and he said, you need to, you need to accept the fact that this is really going to hurt. You need to understand that in the next six minutes, you're going to go through a lot of pain. Just understand that. Accept that it's going to happen and then get ready to punch it in the face when it comes at you. And, uh, you know, so that's how it goes. Uh, if anyone's ever done a 2K and it wasn't painful, you probably weren't going as fast as you could. So you need to understand 
that that's what it is. That's how it goes. That's what this sport is. And there's going to be moments where you want to quit. And if you can, you know, it's not a, you know, you're not, you're not soft for admitting that you're going to have moments of those thoughts. But if you can think about them before they happen, if you can accept that they're going to happen, then, then you might be able to come up with an answer before, uh, before it hits you. Here's an interesting question. Uh, how would you address your crew when the biggest, fastest guy on your team leaves for another bigger, better funded crew? It's, how would I address my team if a guy on my team left for another team? Right. If the best guy on your team left. Um, no, there's really not much to address. Uh, it's kind of, you know, we, we uh, Coach Gladstone um, – is a big New England Patriot fan, and he likes uh, he likes reading from the Gospel of Bill Belichick, who always preaches about next man up. It's how it goes, uh, and I think everybody here can maybe recall a boat where the the best guy probably wasn't helping the boat. It's possible to have a fast boat without. Uh, first of all, I don't even know what best guy means. Uh, there's a there's a there's a hundred different reasons why somebody can be good or be the best at rowing. Um, uh, so, you know, okay. The guy with the best herb score leaves, so be it. We all need to get faster. We all need to keep, keep working and make our herb scores faster. Or, you know, I, you know, the, the, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that much of an issue. And that's because of what rowing is. Now, if I'm a football coach and my star quarterback leaves, well, now you're kind of looking at who's the next quarterback going to be. Or if your leading scorer on the basketball court leaves or gets injured, you're kind of wondering where the rest of the points are going to come from. But, uh, you know, if we're talking about rowing in an eight and there's eight guys, uh, I, I, I tell that, I say that to the guys at Yale a lot. When we're doing seat races and there's two eights next to each other and one eight wins by open water and we switch the bowmen and all of a sudden it's a full reversal I get pretty angry at the stern seven from the boat that won the first piece and saying, you're, you're telling me that I, I put in a different bow man and that changed the whole rhythm. Uh, and I think that that's the beauty of the sport is that if the best guy leaves or the best guy gets injured, it's not really a problem. You just take the next man up and uh, you keep moving forward. Great answer, man. That was good. The, um, uh, how would you motivate or how would you, what would you say to kids right now, uh, high school kids who their next season is 11 months away? You know, this has been taken from them. What, what would you say to them? Yeah, it's going to be pretty difficult. Uh, I think, I don't think, I, I'm, I know that, the, you know, in terms of training, in terms of working, the worst part of my rowing career was when I had to train alone. I was, I was abysmal at working out alone, uh, going home in the summer, going home for Christmas vacation, you know, getting a little bit of a break. Any time that I had to be at my parents' house by myself uh, was some of the worst training I've ever done. It was just really hard for me to, you know, well, first of all, form a schedule. Uh, that, that was hard to do because you're just kind of like laying around doing this or doing that. So I would start there. I would... I would get into a routine, um, you know, pick, pick something that is going to be productive, but give yourself a practice time. And then you're not going through the day for the next 11 months, deciding what time you're going to do an herb. Uh, because that's, that's where I struggled. I'd wake up or I'd go to bed at night and say, yeah, I'll get up early and get the herb out of the way. That, that'll be great. Uh, getting that over with. And then I wake up in the morning and I, I'm, I'm going to roll back over. I'll, I'll do the herb later. And then, you know, you wake up and you're like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do the erg before lunch. And then lunch comes and you have lunch. And then you say, oh, I just ate lunch, so I can't do the erg now. I'll do it. And next thing you know, it's like 11 p.m. at night and you're going to bed saying, oh, I'll just do two workouts tomorrow. So give yourself a schedule and then hold yourself accountable to that. And, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the best thing in the world right now to be around other people, but that's what I needed to train. And thankfully now there's, there's you know, there's a lot – more ways to kind of train in a group without physically being in a group. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, we didn't really have all, all this great technology where you could 
you know, send pictures of your ERG score or kind of share, share information or set up, set up webcams and do workouts together, you know? So if you know that you're like me and you struggle to work out by yourself, then don't put yourself in that position. And if you know that you drag your feet walking around the house saying, Oh, I don't know when I'm going to work out. Well then give yourself a practice time, find a way to hold yourself accountable to that. But you need to understand for the next 11 months, you need to understand what has to happen, i.e. how much work needs to be done. And then you need to understand your strengths and your weaknesses, and you need to play to those and not put yourself in a position uh, to be weak. And I didn't do that a lot. Uh, and I, you know, anytime I went home for Christmas or Thanksgiving or went home for the summer, uh, I would struggle because I didn't put myself in a strong position. Uh, guys that are out there, a lot of you have asked about uh, coxing and coxins. Mary Whipple will be joining us on the 16th, seven o'clock, it's a Thursday night. And so all of your questions about coxing, I'm, I'm certainly you can, uh, you can tune in and ask her that. A um, Couple more for you, Mike. So we're getting close everybody. We'll ask a couple more and then, uh, um, Mike, are you still sharing your screen or? Yeah, you want me to stop? Yeah, that'd be great uh, if you could do that. A um, Couple of questions about conditioning. Uh, in terms of, do you, do you like cross training? What do you think about running and other forms of conditioning and how much did you do as a high schooler? How much, how much training did you do in a day or in a week? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I know I kind of went on a rant about, uh, you know, if you want to get better at shooting foul shots, you have to shoot foul shots. And the only way to get faster on the erg is to row the erg, but cross, uh, cross training helps. Um, you know, it's a good break from the ERG, but you need to be realistic about it. Uh, you know, you need to make sure that when it comes time to cross train, you're cross training because, you know, you've done enough work on the ERG at that time and it's, you know, it's time to take a break from it. But, um, I liked, I like running. I still like running. Uh, I was never much of a stationary biker. Um, I don't know. I always struggled to get my heart rate up on the stationary bike and, you know, I felt like the erg was enough static training. Uh, you know, part of the fun of rowing and running is is going somewhere. Uh, you can you can push yourself and go somewhere faster. So I enjoy. I always enjoyed running, but obviously there are some people out there that might not enjoy running. Uh, I was never much of a big swimmer, but I hear good things about it. I guess. Uh, you know, but you, again, it's kind of going back to the education. You just, you need to educate yourself on this kind of stuff. You need to educate yourself on, uh, you know, physiology and nutrition and training. And that's going to help you cross train. Uh, when you understand what you need to do and what needs to happen and kind of what the goal is, whether you're getting ready for a 2K or you're getting ready for a 6K or you're getting ready for the racing season or you're out of shape trying to get back in shape, once you kind of have that plan and you understand what the goal is, then it'll be easier to decide when and for how long to uh, cross train. And uh, for just for regular training purposes, I think 60 to 80 minutes of steady state is always a good option. It's incredibly boring, uh, but you know that's, that's kind of a good default. And just being creative with how to break it up. Uh, for the longest time, like when I was younger in my rowing career, I hate it sitting on the erg for more than 20 minutes. And then it got to the point later in my career where I didn't, I didn't want to get off the erg. Uh, so I didn't want to stop and go again. So I would just do pieces straight through. But again, you need to understand the work that has to happen. Meaning this week I need to accomplish this type of work. And then that'll help you decide uh, how to break the pieces up or how much work to do or, um, you know, when, when to cross train. Uh, I tell you, there, we'll do two more questions, Mike, and then uh, get everybody going. Um, there's some questions here about uh, recovery and rest. Last night, we had a really great webinar. It, it'll be on the U.S. Rowing website, so you'll be able to go see it about recovery, strategies for recovery. So I'm going to uh, point you in that direction, Joshua. Um, and anybody who else, it, it, last night was an exceptional uh, – we've had some great ones right in a row here. Um, Mike, first of the two questions. Do you think that any of the advice that, that you've given today would vary whether you're coaching girls or boys in high school? 
for any advice that I think would vary. Um, no, uh, I don't think anything was going to be gender specific. I also don't think any of it is, is kind of skill set specific. Um, obviously, I, I've never coached uh, women, and I, I have to imagine that there are a lot of differences in coaching the two. But, you know, bringing something to the table every day and adding value doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter how bad you are. Uh, I think a lot of this is hopefully, hopefully resonates with everybody. And this is probably the big question. So you might have to think about this one. Which assistant coach in the IRA league would you least like to play one on one to a hundred in basketball? That's the Sam Baum question. I challenged Sam to a one-on-one -on -one game of basketball up to a hundred and he always declines. Well, so, he's going to be giving a seminar, a webinar pretty soon, so we can get him on here and talk to him. Yeah, we don't need to go down that road. He he know, like he knows he knows the he knows the truth. I don't need to <laughs> I don't need to bore the uh, 263 people with that. Well, everybody out there, uh, you know, I, I think I speak for them. And uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. It's been great having you. Uh, for those of you out there still listening, the webinars are found on this page on US Rowing's website. Um, they we will have links to the webinars that we've done this week up as soon you know hopefully by tomorrow we'll have the rest of them up um you know we're, we're putting these out there for our members and we hope that you're enjoying them you'll receive an evaluation tonight so please take the time to to give us feedback that feedback's important as we move forward and try to do a whole bunch more mike can't thank you enough it's great to have you uh, for those of you um, i will send this out as well uh, mike has put his email on there if you have questions that you think um that he'd be great at answering for you uh, please, he's already said in advance, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're welcome to, to send him emails. Yeah, and, please do. Um, please do. I'm happy to chat. I've got nothing else going on in my life right now, Chris. So, um, except that basketball game with Sam. So, um, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, want to smoke. Well, let's just see, we'll take one last look if there's anything on here. Uh, guys, so thank you all for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you're all safe and sound wherever you are. And Mike, take care of yourself. Thanks so much for joining us. It's, it's appreciated.